Hey everyone, and my name is Kamis Ranavardi, co-president of Columbia DC and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Welcome. We are fortunate to have uh, Dan Petrosky, founder and owner of Massacin, especially around the harvesting moon, to discuss wines and its trajectory and approach to winemaking. We are also fortunate to have John Bonnet, managing editor of Resi, as our host. Please allow me to uh, briefly introduce Dan and John, uh, but I do encourage everyone to check our site to see their full bios and references to wine, books, etc. Uh, Dan Petrosky is founder and winemaker of Massacin and the head winemaker of Lark at Larkmead Vineyards. And uh, he was born in born and raised in Brooklyn, went to Columbia University to study history and play college football. He made his way from NYC to Italy, to California to follow his passion and the rest is fermented into an uh, illustrious career in winemaking in uh, Napa Valley. He was uh, 2017 winemaker of the year from San Francisco Chronicle. Then is also at the forefront of the climate crisis discussion in Napa Valley. Our host John Bonnet is currently the managing editor of Resi. Previously, he was senior contributor editor uh, of uh, Punch, where he has written a regular column. And for nearly a decade, he was the wine editor and chief wine critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. His work in wine and food journalism has won numerous awards, including two James Beard Foundation Awards for his work at the Chronicle and repeated accolades from the Association of Food Journalists. So without further ado, John and Dan, please take it away. Hey everyone. Um, I'm gonna hope that, amazing. I love it. Dan, I can see it. <laughs> um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm really excited for this. And uh, when uh, Kambiz and I were talking about uh, doing wine, um, wine programming uh, related to Columbia, uh, Dan was immediately the first person I was hoping uh, we would get involved. Um, and I'm excited that uh, he's here. Um, we're going to dive into it in a sec, but for my um, my two second sort of thoughts about um, tonight and discussion uh, and Dan's remarkable work. Um, so, astonishingly, I was not the person who um, who uh, who nominated Dan as winemaker of the year because I was already gone from the Chronicle. But um, I went back and realized that I had made him a winemaker to watch uh, six or seven years earlier. Um, and uh, so in 2013, uh, I had this book come out, The New California Wine, um, and it featured a very handsome hand uh, in it um, that was holding, were these, were these Sauvignon Verde? <laughs> um, and so uh, Dan, um, I've known for a long time, um, has been really um, not just a superstar in, in California in general and in the new California, but, but really someone who has um, changed and refocused and, and really revolutionized the discussion about California wine, about American wine, uh, and uh, as Kambi said, and we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit, um, what the future of wine in California and specifically in Napa Valley is going to be um, as things change and get more unstable and warmer. Um, and uh, a lot of the things we'll be talking about tonight, uh, I um, have talked to Dan about uh, at length um, over um, some wine, but more often Negronis, um, usually at uh, like Frankie's 457 or somewhere else in Brooklyn. So uh, in tribute, I am Negroni'd up. Uh, Dan is a sucker and he's on Pacific time. Uh, so he still has more work to do. This is made with um, Perry Ta Gin. So Brooklyn Gin, Massacin Vermouth, um, uh, of course, and uh, Campari. So I feel like I've, we've tied together uh, the three elements of your career somehow. Um, so, yeah, is like, 
we I don't know that we've ever really talked about Colombia. <laughs> no, um, actually, the, when you first said, I thought you were going to initiate the story about how we kind of connected, which was I sent you a blind email to your Chronicle account back in the day. And, um, and you wrote back immediately and said, yeah, I read about you in Columbia College today and I just like blew you off. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, John. Um, but yeah, that was like- Doing, the first doing time. a newspaperman's job. <laughs> that, I think that was the first and the last time we talked about it. Yeah. Um, we did share some mutual friends and we actually, we did talk about after college. We, we, still, we worked in the same, working in time life building at the same time, different floors, different companies. So uh, yeah, we had, we kind of walked the parallel paths for a bit, um, but really got together, you know, as you said, like in 2010, when you were on the forefront of chronicling, no pun intended, you know, what was going on in American wine. And when we speak of American wine, we speak of California, no offense to the other 49, but really California is the driver um, of, of great produce and, and not, and great winemaking so we we're very fortunate but yeah I, I do want to say John that your book and I, and I actually did mention this to you years later when you left us to go head back home and head back east to New York you could I did say to you that you were <laughs> you uh, um, we need a champion for California wines you were you were our voice for a very long time and um, you kind of like got behind us and made sure that you know kept us on our toes and motivated us to, to kind of keep pushing the envelope and um, and we lost that for a number of years and since you left it's been kind of hellfire with earthquakes and wildfires and, and largest recorded rainfall in California history uh, I'm just waiting for the entire state of California to, plane out. <laughs> to kind of float off into the Pacific you know some you know big Crosby movie in Hawaii or something <laughs> so, yeah but no, I wish I was in person hanging out with you in, uh, in, in Brooklyn in a bar, drinking a cocktail, talking about wine. Some of my, uh, my, my favorite conversations. So hopefully we can recreate that a little here tonight. Exactly. So, so how, let, like, let's, let's talk about the Columbia part. Like how did, how did you end up at Columbia? Like I, I, I knew at some point that you had played football, which um, I don't know if you had the trajectory of pretty much all of my friends who played football, which was like they played a year or two and then, they discovered that there were other things to do, like drink, um, yeah. <laughs> a, a precursor to both of our future careers. Um, I, <laughs> no, you know, it's like I, I was fortunate to play uh, football in, in high school in Manhattan uh, at Xavier. And um, I grew up watching Ivy League football on, you know, PBS on Channel 13 in Brooklyn. You know, and that, like those early morning 10 o'clock games before, you know, the, the, before the real college football started. You know, University of Michigan, Notre Dame, etc. Um, so I was, I was totally into it. I didn't know Columbia existed. I didn't know anything about the Ivy League. My parents took me to go to college, um, and I had every intention of leaving, um, leaving Xavier, going to college, and then going to work on Wall Street, um, like just because I saw that there was an opportunity for a little bit of cash and a little bit of money. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know Columbia existed, and I thought that it would be a great opportunity when they recruited me. I only applied to one other college at the time who had recruited me for football in, in the Patriot League. And, um, and then Columbia came knocking and, and you know, Coach Ray Tellier came, visited my house, uh, had dinner with me and my mom and my brother. And, um, and I was like, wow, this sounds pretty cool. And I didn't know anything about Ivy League. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Columbia. Um, and, and then, what yeah. What was the record at that point? <laughs> Yeah, we so my senior season, I did play all four years. Um, we had a great, we had attrition. You know, we started with 45 um, players freshman year, and we ended up with 16 to, to graduate. And but that 16 was we're lucky enough to say we were the first winning season in 25 years um, in my senior year. So per perseverance. <laughs> um, but I will I will say the funniest thing, and I'm going to jump the gun here with a story. But we all we all remember Columbia Cottage. Um, you know. Right on Fort uh, Amsterdam and 116th, and um, all the all the white wine you can drink with your beef and broccoli for 8.95. California Chablis. Yep, yeah, that was that was you know that's a college kid's dream, right? So um, I I remember my freshman year that Columbia Cottage was my tequila moment. Like I drank so much after losing our our Friday night freshman football game to Harvard 
you know, coming with these grand aspirations of being a winner and uh, losing. I drank so much that night that I literally couldn't smell white wine for about seven years without getting nauseous. I just like, and now I'm all, you know, Masakana is the only white wine winery in Napa Valley, you know? So um, <laughs> thank you again, Columbia, for, you know. Thank you, Columbia I, Cottage, for. Uh, cottage. <laughs> so, early uh, on. Uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. I was thinking about Columbia Cottage because I was writing about Chinese restaurants in New York this yeah. week and was like, do I actually tell the story of how much I drank at Columbia Cottage? Um, and I didn't, but I probably, <laughs> clearly I should have, you know. Are they, are they on Resi? <laughs> uh, they are gone. Like the spectator wrote them a, like a proper obit. Wow. As it were. Um, they, yeah, no, they are, they're not on Resi. <laughs> That would be that would be a great one to have on. Right? How the business model of giving away white wine doesn't actually sustain you. <laughs> hey, I tried it for years. I mean, I had to get people to drink white wine. Um, <laughs> what? Um, you guys should have a graveyard for Resi. Like all the restaurants are no longer around that you just like fantasize you're going to make a, a reservation at. You know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. I mean, you, maybe someone will like, someone will resurrect one of those great spots, you know, oh, that's been off or something, yeah. you know, we'll get, we'll, we'll get Cafe Grey back. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is our act three. We're going to reopen Columbia Cottage with natural wine. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry. So yeah, that was my, that was my Columbia football wine moment. I, I, I credit losing to Harvard for me being a winemaker. <laughs> Love it. Harvard appreciates that. <laughs> um all right so so you so you graduated and then you you did not get into wine like you you i assume aside from columbia cottage were not like super into wine at that point no but I, so I, as a football player um i wanted to be an art history major at columbia and i said as a football player i just felt you know peer pressure i was going to be kind of you know kind of made fun of by my teammates in the locker room so i just dropped the art and went to history um, and I realized I didn't, I, I never meant to go to Wall Street. I didn't want to go to Wall Street. Um, I wanted to pursue another path. And, and I, I was, as I saw my friends getting job interviews and getting jobs before January of senior year, I was still struggling, like interviewing for marketing jobs and advertising jobs and really not having a path forward. I considered military. Xavier was a Jesuit military high school that I went to college. I went to high school with. I considered, you know, a, a an ROTC program after school. I considered coaching for Columbia as a, as a teacher's assistant, you know, type of uh, position. Um, but then I ended up getting a job at a marketing company out in Detroit. And I worked in Detroit and Chicago for a little bit and came back to New York with no job, just wanted to miss New York, New York City, and ended up uh, as an intern in Sports Illustrated um, and their web department, which in 1996, was, you know, the, the days of AOL and CompuServe, mostly CompuServe. I mean, the, the hilarious part is that we were both in the Time Life building working on internet stuff, yeah. like within the Pathfinder, Time Inc. Yeah. Sphere, whatever. And in, <laughs> in, 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 in 1995, I dropped the class in college because the professor said we had to email it to, to, to his, the homework. I was like, I don't know how to email anything. And like 1996, I'm building Sports Illustrated's website. <laughs> it's crazy. It was like those were the days. Um, and I, yeah, so I ended up, I ended up doing, you know, uh, sticking it out and um, and and having the opportunity to work at Sports Illustrated, Sports Illustrated for kids, um, building the websites. Um, but during that period of time, you know, magazines have always been really important to me. I wasn't a, I wasn't a book reader, so going to like core curriculum was really tough for me. I was a magazine reader as a kid, and um, and I would remember going to the, the newsstand on a Thursday, first Thursday of the month when magazines dropped, and, and buying stuff and being a subscriber to like things like Condé Nast Traveler when I was 17 years old, 16 years old, um, and because my family didn't travel, you know, I never left the country, we went to the Jersey Shore as kids, and um, so for me, it was always aspirational, and working for a company like Time Inc., I didn't realize how good it was um, until a couple of years in. You know, it was a, it was it was an incredible history in that building, incredible history of you know of, of journalism, uh, photojournalism with life, and and then from sports and finance and 
And then the women's publications took off and just really, you know, kind of changed content, you know, with, with people and in style and real simple and all that stuff. And that, and that actually, um, you know, that got, that moved me, moved me um, out of, of Time Inc, unfortunately, um, because I was kind of pigeonholed as a, uh, working on Sports Illustrated and working at um, Time Magazine on the men's side of the uh, division of the company, as opposed to the female. So I was on my way to go work at the Wall Street Journal before I took that path to, to, to a, a stage in Italy for a year working on a vineyard in, in 2005. Um, but really it was, um, you know, it was, it was eating and drinking in New York City that got me into wine. Like when I was able to smell white wine again, <laughs> like I was able to like go into You didn't want to work for Shelter Mags? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so you're in New York and you're like, you know, you've got, it's, it is the tequila thing. My, my tequila thing was actually with tequila at tequila. the cafe and that did me in for <laughs> yeah, like good 15 years. But um, so you're in New York and you're uh, getting into wine again, food and wine. And so, yeah, how do you... How does that transform itself into like, I'm going to go hang out in Sicily for a year? It was, um, I became the guy, because uh, I didn't make, in publishing, as you know, John, we, we didn't make a lot of money. Uh, and I know what you're about. <laughs> so um, I was thinking, I was like, how do I drink really well within my means? And, and the only way I could think about doing that was reading. And I do profess that, you know, from the late 90s to the early aughts, I read more about wine than I consumed it. I knew more about wine, great wines of the world, than I'd ever tasted them. And it was, uh, it was really about reading books, reading magazines, um, engaging, and, um, and being able to tell stories. And having a lot of friends from school who went to work on Wall Street, I became like their de facto dude to hang out with because I knew my way around the wine list. Of a, uh, of a restaurant. So I would go to a lot of fancy steakhouse dinners and order the great bottle of wine for a hundred with the awesome story behind it, as opposed to just picking the most expensive wine on the list to satisfy your client. And that is really truly was one of my fortes and my strengths at the time. And, um, and no one, you know, no one lost business because they weren't buying Opus One and Insignia at steakhouses. You know, they all, we still, my friend still did really well on Wall Street and, and succeeded and we had great dinners and a lot of fun. This um, is your superpower. It's like, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dazzle you with that. <laughs> so, so I was that guy and, 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 you know, I, the one thing I was fortunate to do um, when I worked at Time Inc. was work on the editorial side for a couple of years with the, with the, internet and, and I did write a little bit for the, some of the from some of the websites and stuff and then I worked on the consumer marketing side I worked on the finance side and then I finished on the advertising side so I then ended up with a corporate card and, and entertaining clients myself and still being able to tell those stories about wine um, and I started to get to know so much about wine but I didn't have any clue about how it was made and I loved timing so much I was there for 10 years and I never wanted to leave but the job offer at the Wall Street Journal was too good to pass up but I said, fuck this, if I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna drop the mic and really leave and get myself into, um, it, it, just go away. Like live what live that aspirational experience that those magazines gave me when I was a kid flipping the pages of Condé Nast. And, and so I said, I said, buy the Time Inc, which I, I was only four years, five years away from my Time Inc sabbatical anyway, I should have just waited it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I said no to Wall Street Journal and I, and I, I moved to Sicily and I was fortunate because I had um, I've done the executive program at NYU and my class, there was a, a gentleman who, an Italian, who had been thrown into a company in, in New Jersey, didn't speak English and got passed, you know, got a good score on his, uh, on his uh, GMAT and ended up, you know, coming to NYU executive program and like just becoming my best friend <laughs> and then this guy never spoke he, like he was learning english during this like two-year period and um his family had uh, some relationships with uh wine growers in sicily so he was able to you know get me a you know a stage you know to work on a vineyard for a year um and uh, so yeah i kind of just had like a weird midlife crisis quit my job moved to italy for a year and found something even less lucrative than journalism <laughs> I didn't get paid. I got I got a cornetto and a and a sixty cents espresso every day for like a year. That was like what I got paid on the way at the gas station on the way to the vineyard. It's like great. 
So this was Valle Delicate? <laughs> Valle, this is, that was Valle Delicate, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so were you, you had recovered, you had recovered the white wine part by then. And so were you like, were you interested in sort of in Catarato and the Sicilian whites and? Yeah, no, this was, you know, I, I jokingly say that, you know, uh, Etna, when I lived in, in Sicily, I was on the Eastern Seaboard in Catania, just under Mount Etna. And, it, you know, I started drinking a lot of white wines because it was this Mediterranean lifestyle, Mediterranean weather, Mediterranean culture. Um, and I don't remember, honestly, I can't name more than one or two Etna red wines. And, and if, if anyone on the, on the call is a, is a geeky, you know, Italian or, you know, kind of last 10 year uh, drinker of Italian red wines, Etna is, you know, right up there at the top, uh, Mount Etna, uh, making some really wonderful red wines. But, but the culture, even back then in 05, 06, when I lived there, no one was drinking Etna red wine. We only drank Etna white wines, um, had this really beautiful kind of granular texture to them, beautiful kind of salinity and, you know, just totally representative of, of the Mediterranean Sea. We drank a lot of those, you know, uh, a lot of Caracante, Cararato, uh, Grillo, we drank Insolia, we drank a lot of just stuff that was meant to be, because at seven or eight o'clock at night when you're sitting outside eating, it was warm. And there was like a nice warm breeze coming off the sea and, and it, it made sense to me. And that was a big part of why I started Masakan because I, I felt like when I moved to California, the culture of wine drinking here was all about drinking, you know, drinking local, which I agree with 100%. And I actually, a big part of my climate conversation is- The asterisk. Yeah, I mean, you know, 60% of all California wines are consumed in California. I mean, that's, that's a local industry if you think about it. Um, and so I, I, I was like shocked that, you know, I got, I started out at Pinot Noir and Chardonnay over at Dumont in 06 and then landed at Lark Mead in uh, January of 07 full time. And I just, was knee deep in Cabernet and, and heavy Pinot and, you know, coming out of that, you know, peak Pinot movement, Costa Brown movement. And, um, and, and I just was like, why, do, why, are we, why are we drinking, you know, what our weather is like? And then I, and I thought about one of your colleagues a lot during this era too, um, you, at the Chronicle, um, you're, you're the restaurant critic and he'd always complain about the wine list in San Francisco saying that, you know, all the food is farm to table, but the wines aren't local. And, and I do believe because the California wine community wasn't making the style of wines, we were slightly behind the, the kind of the food eating culture because the food culture in California is very much attributed to the climactic culture where I don't think the wine ever got, you know, kind of that kind of balance. Does that make sense? Like kind of coming together. And I still don't know if we're there yet. I mean, so it's, was a big part it's interesting that. and um i should i should you know uh just is as in my hosting duties um if you have questions um I, you know uh use the uh the q a uh in the chat uh and a, uh, ask them and we'll get to them in uh in in due course um so you know at the chronicle so yeah michael michael was having his thing michael and his wine things is a i i need four more negronis and then we can have that discussion all right, I'll buy you that when I see you. No, but but like I, I mean, I was I was writing a lot as well at that time, saying you know like, um, there is this problem, there is this dissonance, especially in San Francisco, which is so farm to table and so focused on local produce uh, and local ingredients. But um, but yeah, the, the at the time, and we're talking the late two thousands, it was really hard to find wines from California that. Um, a that that were that went along stylistically with the food, and this was this was sort of immediately once I got over the fact that like you'd been lurking in Napa, and you know I had to read like Columbia College today to find out that you were there. Um, like this was a conversation we we had a lot, which was you know which was this notion of you know wines that are actually Mediterranean in style, meant to go with. The style of food that that is Californian, modern Californian, that is appropriate to the climate, um, which one stylistically California at the time everything was big, everything was 14, 15, 16 percent alcohol, um, and two it was just like it was, you know, everyone especially in Napa Valley wanted to price things at fifty dollars, eighty dollars, hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars, and like you know e even in San Francisco even now but certainly then like you can't 
you can't buy those wines and drink them on a nightly basis. It's just, it's, it's, it's impossible. And so um, I know this was sort of the, the internal and external discussion you were having, you know, up in Napa making kind of very big, very important, meaning historically important and score wise, you know, critic wise, everything important. Um, Cabernet at Larkmead um, that, you know, that, that those wines had their place, but they were not, uh, they were not really in line with the food. And, you know, anyone who's ever been to a wine pairing dinner, like a Napa Valley Vintners wine pairing dinner has run into this where like, you, you like, you breeze by the Sauvignon Blanc in about two seconds, the very oak Sauvignon Blanc. And then you're like into a long parade of big red wine when it's 85 degrees out and you're eating like lamb and duck and lamb and duck. And you're wondering. And then you and repeat. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. I, 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 I mean, it's, it's very easy for a chef to dive into um, a red wine dinner. It's really hard for them to dive into a white wine dinner um, because not everyone is a fish eater. Um, and I'm not saying every white wine needs to be paired with fish either. But it was, yeah. And, 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 and you know, I think, I, I think, there's you you kind of heralded a bunch of uh, a bunch of young next generation winemakers and I think there's another generation that's underneath us that has just come up that are trying to do you know more of a um, kind of lighter brighter fresher style wines um, there's a question of you know or a comment about recommending Chardonnays and like you know I I mean I I I think Chardonnay is the, the best grape uh, in the world and you know one of my go tos has always been David Ramey Sonoma Coast. And that could be said to be oaked. It could be said to be kind of classic California in its kind of, you know, Chardonnay format. But um, but yeah, it was very, you know, I we think we should make a Chardonnay now. Chardonnay, and, David Ramey, Sherman Coast Chardonnay. Like, to prove a point about the ability to make Chardonnay, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, to just uh, to finish your point about the style of wines in California that kind of we both grew up in, you know, during that kind of late aughts and early two early two tens. Um, but it was very it very much we were, you know, for about twenty years, you know, California winemakers, Napa Valley winemakers, Sonoma County winemakers were making cocktail wines. They weren't necessarily making the 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 you know kind of food friendly table wines that Michael Bauer and yourself were talking about that weren't existing in the restaurants in San Francisco. Um, they were making the cocktail wine. They were making the Negroni, the rum and coke. Um, you know, the things you did before, you know, before you sat down and actually had your meal. And, um, and I think that's still, it's still prevalent in a big part of our community, but I do think that there's a pendulum shift, um, that's coming and it has been coming for a while now, which yeah. is great because, and I've started to see that at, at Larkmead for sure. Um, I would, I would, the last thing I would call a Larkmead wine right now is a cocktail wine. There's so much, you know, great texture to these wines that they don't necessarily feel like the kind of the, the balanced sweetness that you get from a, a great cocktail. Um, yeah, the irony of that being that Michael Bauer is Mr. Cocktail, but um, <laughs> so, um, but, so tell us a little about, about Massacan and the range of wines and what you, yeah. what you're making and, you know, where, also frankly, where, where the grapes are coming from, because um, I think, again, there's, uh, you know, you're working with grapes that are classically Italian or, um, I mean, they would have been called Calatal at some point. I think we've, we've settled on a Californian, um, yeah. but, um, but, you know, these aren't, these aren't sort of, this isn't standard fare for not just Napa, but really anywhere in California. Yeah. So, no, I, and, um, so the, the, the original idea came out of this, this romantic, nostalgic, drinking white wines in the Mediterranean climate, which I really feel like Napa is Mediterranean climate. Um, and so that idea came, came about through a business plan. Uh, it came about through reading, you know, kind of connecting with a few friends of the local, currently kind of uh, mutual friends of ours, Steve Matthias and Stephen Pasolacqua, Andy Smith, my former boss and mentor, just to kind of like source a few fun things, whether it be, you know, Hyde Vineyard Chardonnay or, you know, Tokai Friulano, seven young vert from the Nicolini family that was planted in 1946. Um, so this idea was to create a singular white wine that reminded me of the Mediterranean. And well, might as well use Mediterranean white grape varieties like Tokai and um, Rebola, Pinot Grigio, and Greco eventually. 
um, alongside some Western varieties like Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. Things that, are, that do grow well in Northeast Italy, uh, Sauvignon Blanc grows well, Chardonnay grows well, Tokai and Regola find their home there. So these grape varieties are planted in and around Napa, and that's, that's the interesting thing about there's Napa Valley proper, and then there's the penthouses of Napa Valley, which is the hills that kind of, that kind of create the valley, and then there's the outskirts of Napa Valley. Um, so I work, I work in the outer boroughs. I work in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, Staten Island. I find, I find all of that still New York, right? It's New York City. I, I, I'm able to find, you know, kind of the cheap brands out there. I can find the cheaper grape varieties, the white grape varieties that don't, that, you know, farmers or wise enough business people realize these don't belong in Napa Valley proper because I can make a lot more money selling, growing and selling Cabernet Sauvignon or growing and making Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so, I mean, look, the, uh, when I wear my Larkmead hat, I'm sitting in my Larkmead office, when I wear my Larkmead hat, I'm like, rip all the Sauvignon Blancs off the top. <laughs> There's no reason for us to have it here. Um, get it out and, um, and plant it. That's awesome. It's gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, like, that's my, my, you know, fiduciary duty to Larkmead. Um, but for Mazagon, I'm like, I'm paying farmers to plant these great varieties. And I think, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have, you know, the support of the local media starting with you, John, and um, back in the day, and uh, and national media to say, look, this guy is doing something fun, he's doing something different, uh, it's all white wine, it's Napa Valley, it's a little bit of Sonoma County as well, and um, and the vision was really just to make a singular, you know, white wine, that Calatau uh, version of Conundrum, which was just kind of like, you know, a white wine blend that you bought, you threw it in your refrigerator, you popped the cork, everyone knew what it was, your, your, your mom and uh, all our friends knew what it was. Like today, we have things like, you know, like I wanted to make the Masakan version of that, but in the style of the Mediterranean. So that was the goal. And um, it, was, it was also meant as an educating experience for myself to learn other things. Because I don't have the academic background in winemaking. Um, it was just purely kind of an opportunity for me to, you know, potentially lose some money by fucking it up, <laughs> but um, I was, it's my wine. It'll, you know, it's my wine. A bit. Um, but it was—it's a really good cash flow business. Um, you know, I turn it around. Six months of of, of of making wine and six months of selling wine, and then you turn it. You start it all over again. Um, so yeah. I, I, I want to go back for a sec to, the, to 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 Nicolini and like you said, 1947, because I actually think that's important. Um, which is and and Larkby, frankly, has a history of, with this as well. Which is, you know, the the now people are like, oh, well, it's Chardonnay and it's Sauvignon Blanc, but like, you know, those those are basically like carpetbaggers uh, in in terms of California wine history and certainly Napa Valley, um, and you know, and and before essentially the the eighties, which is when the Chardonnay boom began and yeah. Sauvignon Blanc slightly after, um, you know, the the things that were planted were were in fact not that far off from the things that you're working with. And there are both sort of new new vineyards, but there's also very old vineyards that you work with because the Italian farming history of California, in fact, completely aligns with what Massacan is doing. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I was very fortunate, you know, in, in the sense of being able to find some of this. You know, you gotta remember, I, I always quickly tell the story that you know, California farming was built off of all the immigrants who came to find gold in the 1850s, you know, the 49ers, and they didn't mine for gold, so they ended up landing in, in California and doing what they knew how to do, which is agriculture. I mean, that's European, you know, GDP is based on agriculture. Um, and so they brought what they knew how to do. And, and so the Nicolini family came in 1895, the Salmina family at, at Lark Meat came in, 18, in 1892. Like, you know, a lot of people came prior to them in 1884, Larkmead started, um, and they've had 28 different grape varieties grown on this property over time. We're resurrecting some of them for the future for climate change, because everything is, timing is everything in the, in the world. And, um, and, and the Nicolini's, interestingly enough, you know, they planted that Sauvignon Vert, Tocan Milano, in 1946-47, because they, they had sons who came back from World War II and came back to, you know, their family and their life, and they're like, got why is there no we have any white wine here they had no white wine plants on the property it's like why are we drinking any white wine and so they ended up they literally planted that first block because of that conversation so you, europeans living in america going back to europe and then coming back and saying 
reason why white wine. And in that, I mean, the 80s was all about, you know, you said Chardonnay, it was about vodka martinis, cosmopolitans, cocaine. It was like, there's no, it, I mean, that, like the red wine mark me was um, up until 1995, Larkmead was over 65% of the vineyard was planted for white wine grapes. You know, from 1980 all the way up to 95. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, in 1984, there was more, I think, more French columbard planted in California than there was Cabernet. Or yeah. red, or, or yeah. red wine. We were joking about Columbia Cottage and, you know, cheap California mm -hmm. Chablis, but legitimately, uh, I mean, essentially prior to Kendall Jackson and even well after that, like, you know, inexpensive white carafe wine was a lot of what California was doing. Um, Every so, one of the nuns in my grammar school got, you know, that three pack of those, you know, white, rosé, and red in the wood box with the straw. Yep. Yeah, and those, decant, those glass decanters that you use as water pitchers. <laughs> that was like a Christmas present, like there's four Petrovsky kids every, you know, <laughs> walked in with one of those. <laughs> um, so looking at the question uh, from Daniel Colton um, about uh, inspiration. So, so you were, you were in Napa, you were working with Andy and, you know, the Dumal, which is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but then kind of moving the lark meat and really perfecting Cabernet and then starting Mexican for white wine. But like, you know, we, we talk about a lot that, that what's happening in California now is in some ways a return to the past. So we're there were there were there past past winemakers past wineries history that you look back to when you were starting to think about this in terms of uh in terms of what um what you could do based on what had been done before yeah well i you know i started my career as a wine drinker focusing on california because it was easy it was i knew where i knew where california was on a map i could pronounce the names of, 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 uh, of the wines and the region was all based on grape variety um, focus. So I actually started, you know, thinking about California um, back, you know, way before I, I ended up living here as, uh, uh, as, as purely being inspired by, you know, Savignon Blanc of Rovioli or the Chardonnay of David Ramey or, you know, Kistler, you know, the Kistler Chardonnay was the best selling wine at Gramercy Tavern for, you know, for a decade. Um, and, you know, so I, I had these on my radar. You know, we, we, you're supposed to focus on, on, on red wines, but, um, but you know, I think the Newton unoaked Chardonnay or, you know, unfiltered Chardonnay, like things like that were on my mind, but I turned very quickly. Find the Newton un unoaked Chardonnay, let me know. <laughs> um, so I, I turned quickly to, you know, to Europe after I kind of got my footing and got my kind of, my confidence in California, in California drinking, and because it was pretty quick to learn Napa Sonoma and then learn a few things within inside of it um, and do things that were relevant. And you know, back in the late 90s, you know, 1997, Charlie Zinfandel was like, that was the wine everyone was drinking in 2000 uh, in New York City. And um, so I quickly went to Europe to kind of find the inspiration that the people that are in California, like, you know, like Paul Draper's of the world and the Rick Foreman's of the world when he was at Sterling and then at Newton and then, you know, his own projects. And, and everyone who got inspired to open and start a winery in California was really was inspired by, by Europeans um, and French. I mean, mostly just French. Like no one decided to open up an Italian winery. San Giovese wasn't planted in, in California until 1984 um, commercially. So it, it was it was quite fascinating. Um, so I, I did what all of those guys and girls did. You know, I was inspired by Europeans because they've been doing it for thousands of years. <laughs> um, I have someone who wants to say hi quickly. Sure. Is that Val? Hello. <laughs> you remember when I saw you right before COVID in Chicago for a New York Minute? I did. Oh. Uh, I We love what you do. Last night we drank a bottle of Anya with pesto that we made from our basil in the backyard and uh, some of our friends better basil than he made on his roof but <laughs> it was a glorious combination of of and like it brought us to places that we can't really go right now so <laughs> um it was amazing so, that, that you are in but you're <laughs> But you can't. We'll, yeah. we'll 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 go to the Brooklyn bars. You enjoy like the splendor of California. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Please. 
do it for the next couple of months, and then hopefully we'll get we'll get on travel. Good to see you, Val. Good to see you, Dan. So tell us about sort of the core of, of Mascon, like uh, Ania and and Jamina, and and just what the wines are and and how they're put together. Yeah, and that so so when I I, I, I wasn't joking when I said I wanted to make this kind of blended white wine like conundrum. Um, Ania was really this uh, idealized California version of a Northeast Italian wine that I fell in love with called uh, uh, Fior de Luis, which is made by a winery called Vida Romance in Fiume. Uh -huh. um, and they, uh, that was a blended white wine of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, a little bit of Riesling, a little bit of Malvasia, a little bit of Tokai. And I was able to access those grape varieties here. Sauvignon Blanc was pretty popular, obviously. It still is in, in Napa. Um, the Tokai was this kind of legacy grape variety of the Michelinis. Larkmead had a little bit of it planted as well. Very kind of rare grape variety um, uh, here in California today. And then an even more rare grape variety, Rebola Jala, uh, from, you know, it's, it's a, probably the fourth or fifth most important grape in, in Friuli. And, you know, probably the most important grape in Slovenia. Um, and but, but very much a, a newcomer in California and one that has its own sort of really... It, that was like that was like the the late arrival that that's blossomed. Yeah, and that and that and that came that the first vineyard was planted here in 2000, 20 years ago, and I started working with in two thousand nine. Um, you know, with, with you know, kind of thanks to Steve Mathiason and him kind of making an introduction for me. And Steve still manages and plant and, and we just talked today about when we're picking that next week. Um, so. Yeah, so the, the, the goal was to create this wine that was a blend that, that had all these, you know, kind of these memories of, of the Mediterranean, you know, the florals, the citrus, the bitter almond, the you know, kind of uh, salinity, all those things, and do it at a level that was bright and crisp and clean and fresh. Um, but, you know, I noticed that, you know, some of the stuff I was working with was virus, some of the stuff was old, didn't have all the bright and fresh and crisp that I needed to do, so I had to, I had to really think about blending. And when you blend, it's amazing because you can you can blend away problems and you can accentuate other parts um, when you're blending. So um, the idea of a singular blend was a great idea to start with, but I didn't realize how important it was until I started actually making the wine and realizing, oh shit, these 70 year old Tokai vines have a real tough time getting up in the morning. I mean, if you're 70 years old, I'm like, you're not springing out of bed and you know full of energy. These grapes didn't burn full of energy. But you know the Chardonnay that I was uh, working with was full of acid and freshness and brightness that can kind of help balance out. So I found those balances um, in blending, and that became the core of the program. And, and Anya is the, is the you know my flagship wine. It's the wine I wanted to make. Um, but then you know I have you know I have a secondary wines you know single variety wines having a Blanc and Chardonnay, and those are one of them is really small production from a great vineyard hide. And then the other one has become like a kind of a staple for, for restaurant goers uh, to buy the glass wine um, that you can find all over the country because everyone loves Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, and, and everyone wants to, I mean, to have a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc by the glass um, by a somewhat decent, reputable producer at a, at a good price point. Price point has always been important to me, um, keeping these lower than I, I, than I should be for Napa Valley. Um, and not really trying to make money on this deal, uh, just trying to like make wines that my mother could afford, you know. Um, and even then, it's like no, she yeah. can't afford thirty dollars wine. Yeah, and I was gonna say, and these tend to land sort of in the twenties um, for the most part. Um, so there's an, uh, there's a question we will definitely get to about um, about getting the wines and access to them. Um, but um, two questions I absolutely love. One is. Um, what is the most under or unappreciated grape in Northern California? And the other one, um, to the point of Friuli and Northern Italy, is your thoughts on Cabernet Franc? Uh, Cabernet Franc, um, I, I was just tasting the Larkman Cabernet Franc today, uh, just thinking about starting to pick it on Monday, uh, early next week. Um, I love Cabernet Franc. I think Cabernet Franc has been, it's, it's having a moment now two ways in California, uh, and especially here in Napa Valley. One in, the last 10 years it's been it's been taken on uh it's kind of like it's it's kind of fresher redder greener side it's very kind of loire valley side and then a lot of people are starting to realize that cabernet franc does really well when it's actually planted in your cabernet ground everyone like said the best ground in my vineyard or my parcel of land i'm going to plant cabernet 
Um, and then they would like Merlot and Cabernet Franc and Tiffredo and Malbec, the other Bordelais grape varieties that made their way here, always got the secondary value of land. But once they, people started to think that Cabernet Franc should be planted in the great, great sites, um, the production and the quality has risen. Um, but now we need to get Cabernet winemakers of California to stop making Cabernet Franc in a Cabernet style and make it a little bit more, make it big and structured and bold and powerful, but also fresh and red fruited as opposed to, you know, Cabernet blue and I, black fruited. Don't need the new oak on Yeah, I, no, I'm laughing because I remember talking to, um, to Bob Foley at some point when I was writing a story about Cabernet Franc and he was like, well, as long as you like burn the green bean out of it, by which he meant you pick it at 28 bricks and it's yeah. raisins. And then, yeah. then Cabernet Franc is ripe. And it's like, dude, it's like, have you, have you ever tasted anything, not only from the Loire, but to your point, like, have you ever tasted anything from Northern Italy where Cabernet yeah. Franc is a long, long tradition? And same thing, it's, it's mineral, it's saline, it's fresh. Um, no, and I, and I love the Cabernet, it's funny because, you know, Cabernet, the Sicilian, the, for, for, excuse me, the Perulians, they treat the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, with the respect. So when they speak of Cabernet, they're actually speaking of Cabernet Franc. When they speak of Sauvignon, they're actually speaking of Sauvignon Blanc. And it's like, so if they speak of Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> um, so, but no, I, I, do, I, think, I think one of the, I mean, and you know him personally, and you know his wine well, but Chris Brockway was like one of the early first, you know, movers on this fresher, redder, greener yeah. side of Cabernet Franc back in the day. And, uh, and I think that is kind of, permeated a lot of the culture of the next generation of drinkers. So Cabernet Franc. Um, I'm coming with a jug to get some large meat Cabernet Franc before you blend it. Please, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. We've, John, yeah. you, I, you gotta come and see it, or I gotta bring some wine home to you, because I've, I've really taken a pendulum slip chip on the large meat wines. And, and you know, I've always said that, you know, the large meat could do, do so warm and so dry and so windy and stressful up here in Northern Napa Valley, that lark mead can actually do the bigger, powerful, you know, deep, rich, intense, fruited wines. But I'm trying to like bring it back a little bit, make it a little more textured, slightly more elegant, uh, lower lower the extraction through lower alcohol. You know, I'm, I've bottled a bunch of wines over the last three years that were already 14% alcohol um, for a Napa Cabernet with no green, with no herbaceous that, that scared Bob Foley. Yeah, the, yeah. wine police are coming. <laughs> I'm like I told my I told Larky's assistant today. You know, we just picked some Cabernet at like 22 eight, and, and I was like, "Yeah, this wine won't actually get to the critics for about three years, so we'll get we're not going to get fired until then." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and what about uh, so most unappreciated uh, grape in Northern California? Unappreciated. Uh, that's a that's a hard one. Let me think about that. I'm not. I'm, do you have I, any I don't know where I would go with that. Aside from like Riesling, but you know, Riesling is, you know, once it's 60 years old, it's great. I'm shaking, California. I'm shaking my head at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't have the context, my wife, Valerie, who popped in, um, used to sell a lot of German Riesling and Austrian Riesling. So she is a Riesling. Oh, I'm going to say something. I'm going to. And, and no, and yeah, Val, Val, if anyone knows Riesling, it's Val. Um, I'm going to say something, and actually I will say the, the, the Tomer Rieslings are, are, are beautiful, beautiful wines. Um, <laughs> Not my hand. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, I will say that, and I know this may be controversial, John, I, I want to get your reaction when I say this, but I'm going to say Syrah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. No, I mean, it's, we'll it's, well, it's, no, I mean, so I, I'm curious because I, you know, I've, I've sort of settled on what I think is an appropriate template for Syrah um, in California, but, um, but I'm, I'm curious for your take because, because I don't, you know, the lack of appreciation of, for California Syrah is not undeserved. It is, I, I, and I'll go to my drinking days. Uh, picking up a bottle of wine in the liquor store on 43rd and 10th Avenue where I lived in Hell's Kitchen. And I used to buy Rosemont because it had, you know, it was $9.99 and it had gold medals on the bottle. You know, I was drinking a lot of GSM, Rosemont, Shiraz. And I think that price point, I think what happened with California Syrah was we were inundated with Australian Syrah. And it was at a price all of our, point. All of our dirt from New York comes out now. 
And it was like, it was at a price point that just, I think California Syrah came out at such a high level price point with not an understanding of like why anyone would pay that for California, whether it be Andrew Murray, you know, down in Santa Barbara County or something, or, you know, but I think today, you know, I've had, I've done blind tastings and, you know, at Rebel in New York with, uh, with some A Syrah um, and some, and, you know, some Pax Syrahs and uh, Wind Gaps and stuff. And, and I do think a lot of people, I think there's, it's underappreciated. I think we still have a long way to go. Arnold Roberts, yeah. um, I, think there, I think there's a really great uh, potential for Syrah, which is we haven't hit yet. And I think it actually be, might be great in the next 20 years if you think about climate change. Um, which I want to get to in a sec. I, there's a, a quick question uh, you ever, uh, that I do want to ask. Have you ever tried making sparkling in Massacre? Um, if I do that, it will probably be Moscato di Asti, um, in that sense, because I, <laughs> and, and you know, the, the greatest, oh, sparkling <laughs> the great, the greatest, um, the greatest new sparkling winemaker in, in California, probably Michael Cruz. And, um, but, um, but, and I asked him, I said, Hey, any interest in one day making a Moscato for me? And he said, no. <laughs> it's very difficult to make that. No, you're not gonna get to do it. It's not your traditional method, um, but no, I think I think my 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 wines offer enough uh, heartburn, you know, because of the acid levels already that uh, I don't need to add a little extra, you know, addition to you know carbonation to make it even worse. But no, no, I, there's too many great sparkling wines in the world. Uh, so we've got a, a bunch of questions about fires, which um, I want to talk about a little, but that's also a good segue to talk a little about climate, which again, like this has been the, the, the drum you've been beating for a while. So A, just how are things going in terms of lark meat and mascon and the fires, but B, you know, what, I mean, I think people get very broad strokes of how climate is impacting wine generally, but in California in particular, um, but you've put a lot of thought into actually how how this is going to shake out in, in 10, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, 2014 was my first earthquake I've ever, ever experienced in my life. Um, you know, then, you know, once I got here, we always talked about droughts. Um, you know, I, then we go into like the 14 earthquakes and droughts and then 16, 17, we had the largest recorded rainfall in history. Fire, earthquake, fire, drought, earthquake. Fire. And, and it's just my most deadliest fire and the largest fire in California history. And now we've just got even a lot more larger. 33%, the number came out to I think 33% of Napa County burned in this last two week period. Um, and, you know, it, we are still a rural agricultural community. I mean, you know, Napa County only has 130,000 residents. It's small. If you think about it in the land grand scheme of things, it's fairly small. Um, so large land mass, but a small population. Um, but it's been, it's been quite disturbing for me, you know, a city kid to like live in the country and, um, and to see this kind of, you know, I, I the reason why climate became really important to me, because I, and I jokingly talked about my fiduciary duty at Larkmead and said, Hey, don't plant too much Avenue Blanc. Um, Larkmead celebrated its 125th anniversary this year, 2020, you know, probably the worst year to have a birthday, um, especially 125th. But, um, but a very, very important winery, both today and historically in Napa and in California. So, and so two or three years ago, I started bringing this up to the owners of Larkin. I said, why do you want to pass on, you so big into the generational shift and the change and the legacy, like why do you want to pass on a business, an agricultural business that is stricken with all these things we just talked about, floods and fires and and droughts and earthquakes and like why would you want to pass on something that's going to become more difficult to do and therefore more expensive to manage and to produce and on top of that you're going to sorry they're, they're working in the cellar um on top of that you're dealing with the whole cultural change from baby boomers to gen x's to um z's millennials that are moving away from what we do best uh, which is make really expensive, proud, Napa Valley Cabernet. Um, and, and it was just, it was the classic, you know, business owner, small family business owner response, because I want to. Um, and I said, all right, well, then it's my duty to make sure that we can pass marketing on for 125 years and pass it on to the next generation and the grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I was just, 
baffled by, I, I mean, I collect da daily weather reports from Mark since I've been here. And, and it just baffles me to see the shift. It's, and I, and I, I wrote an op-ed about this and called the slow boiling of the Napa frog. Like we're totally just like, this is just intensifying. And um, well, what can we do? We're the greatest farmers in the world, hands down. We're the most precise, best farmers in the world. We can do anything we want to do viticulturally. We have more technology than everyone else. We steal everyone else's you know, tractors and shit and stuff like that. But what we do really well is farm. And we think about our farming. And we, and we don't necessarily practice it all the time. But we are more advanced than most, uh, most grape growing communities in the world. Um, so it's not about, it's not about like finding the right technology and finding the right rootstock for the right soils. We've done all that already. It's like, what is going to shift? What's going to happen to our community when we put all of our chips in the Cabernet basket and we push what we went all in on Cabernet and Cabernet is not destined to be the greatest grape in America, the way Napa Valley made it the last 40 years. Um, so what's the next 40 years look like? And it's not Cabernet, but we know we can farm grapes at the highest level. Let's find the right combinations and find the right storytelling and the right message. I really think that we have a we have such great opportunity here to make the next. You know, if Paul Draper wanted to make you know Chateau Margot, and you know Dominus wanted to make you know Petrus or whatever, you know, um, and you have these great examples of us trying to mirror and mimic great. Bordelais, great, you know, Chateau models. Like, why can't Larkmead be the next Vegas Cecilia? You know, probably one of the top ten wineries in the world. Why can't Larkmead aspire to be that? You got to play. Think, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you got room for uh, the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> um, because we have, we, so we have about three minutes left, um, and uh, All right. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I'm just looking through uh, this question about pairing. So, okay, so, you know, both with, with like, your Cabernets, but also especially with Masakan, what, what do you love to, what do you love to eat with, with the wines you make? Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, the white wines that I've been making, I've been, you know, I, I love that you guys had some pesto with Anya um, as a nice sauce and pasta. I, I actually, you know, I fell in love with the Friulian grape variety, the Coca Milano and the Ribola Jala. Um, and I love the way they treated the white wines in that region with uh, a diverse set of food, you know, from heavier, heartier dishes, um, goulashes, meat dishes, lamb dishes. Um, they, you know, potato pancake with cheese. The Frico is the is signature of all Friuli, and they drink it with white, they eat it with white wine. Um, so that's like I, the Mazakan wines is super versatile to me. Um, you know, Anya, if, if you were blinded by it, if you closed your eyes and drank it, you, you would have a hard time at first thinking that was a white wine just because it textually has a little bit of body, but also has a little bit of, you know, the kind of bitterness that you would get from, from patterns on a red wine. Um, and, you know, so from the Larkbead side, I, as I was saying earlier, I kind of shifted the, the current wines a little bit to make them more table friendly. Um, I know table wines is not a high value luxury uh, to say a table oh. wine, but they are, it's, it's a real luxury to sit down and drink a great bottle of wine with a wonderful food in front of you. So um, I never felt that, you know, Napa Valley did table wines very well. And, um, but now with the new style over the last five years of, of Larkin, I'm really enjoying the wines across a broad range dishes uh, you know mostly mostly the, the white meats and the, and the darker meats and um and gamey dishes but um that's not stuff that we cook at home that often um you know we definitely are eating out for sure um but you know the texture and the red fruitiness of bark meat right now it's become my my go-to pizza wine in a weird way. <laughs> i want that as a pizza wine <laughs> someday um so super quick, because uh, we've got like a, about a minute or so left. Uh, what's what's coming next for Mascon? What should we look out for? Um, I just I just launched an Instagram only magazine uh, this summer. Um, I have this great uh, collaboration I'm doing with Fiden Press. Um, they're you know kind of getting back to publishing one way or the other. Yeah, back to publishing. They're they're going to be a, they're turning speaking of birthdays. They'll be a hundred years old I think in 2022, uh, 2021. 
Um, and they have a, you know, a kind of a really wonderful deep portfolio, everything from arts and uh, culinary uh, to photography and film. Um, gardening is a new space for them. So we basically have kind of, they've given me the keys to their library and said, hey, whatever you want, we'll let you kind of peruse and curate and edit, I hate the word curate, edit, you know, a selection um, that you can put. And so I, we, I basically created the Moscow Magazine, which is all the things that are, that are that inspiring to me, you know, from the from color, which we launched with the color blue. We're currently at the, at the blue, we're current, currently at the culinary issue. We're preparing the arts issue, which will be in October. Um, and we're kind of following, you know, we're following, you know, the art festivals and the, and the, um, the photography festivals. And we're kind of just sticking on the calendar of that. And these are things, look, especially during the time of COVID, I just saw a, a, a report that said Pinterest did, you know, the, the, the spike in like travel and tourism searches um, is huge. We all want to escape right now. We all want to go somewhere else. Magazines were my escape that brought me to Europe when I never could afford to do it when I was a kid and my family didn't do it as a culture. Um, and now it's like I'm, I'm bringing that back, you know, now that we've been stuck at home um, for a number of months now. I'm bringing that back because it's my inspiration and I'm taking the best of everything I care about. Hopefully, I'm putting it on Instagram only, which is, I don't know anyone else that's doing the, 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 It's gorgeous. So Thank you. Um, we got the dispensation for an extra 10 minutes, so we can oh, cool. ramble on. Um, so I'm curious, we, we were talking about climate. What, you know, what do you think, not just you, but what do you think winemakers in general are going to have to do to, to deal with this? It's, I mean, I have my long list of things and having spent most of the past five years dealing with the French side of it and realizing that most of the problems in California are because Californians copied the French who are in a much colder place um, and have historically been struggling to get sun, which is not a problem in California. What, what are the things winemakers in California are going to have to do in order to you know, not, not even to make sort of the, you know, the very sort of fresh, sleek style, the, the, the new California style, but like just to, just to be able to, to keep having a, a viable crop that doesn't require huge salvage every year. No, and that's, that's the thing. Uh, honestly, I, there's no silver bullet. There's no answer to that question. Um, there, you know, the things that we're realizing is, you know, you, you said it a couple times in this call, John, about, you know, looking back to look forward and going back to look forward. And some of the, you know, some of the old school ways of, of viticulture and, and farming methodology, how we trellis, like everything in Napa right now is so precise, it's so perfect. You drive, you see these beautiful vineyard grows. <laughs> um, but they may, they, what they're proving to be a little bit detrimental in a climate changing world. Whereas like the old umbrella vines, the, uh, the alberello, uh, the trees that they, uh, the, 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 the Italians would call them, um, those are proving to, to be better to protect against sunshine and direct sun and direct heat and the, and the heat intensity. But um, I do think that uh, we have to be we have to be thinking about you know growing in other regions, other places um, that we may have to you know hand over the reins of the greatest wine growing region in, in America to some other region. And I think a lot of companies have done this you know have been there before us in the sense that there you know other like the big bigger Napa Valley companies that have been around since the 60s and 70s are buying in Oregon, they're buying in Washington. Um, so they're investing in land in the north because things are shifting. But um, I, I just think that we have to be mindful of it. I think we all have to be, it's tribal. I mean, uh, you know, climate change is going to be a tribal movement in the sense that we're all going to have to pitch in on our own. Um, and then we're going to have to have big companies, you know, really be impacted financially to, to make a change. And, you know, I jokingly, it's not even a joke. Gallo is probably, you know, Gallo is one of every six bottles of wine made in, in California. They are probably the most forward thinking outside of like the way they farm. But if, if a glass bottle is 45% of all of your carbon footprint, because where it's made, how it's made, how it's shipped all over the place, how much it weighs, Gallo is, is reducing their glass at such a level that they're actually more efficient on carbon release when it comes to like a normal winery than anyone else in the United States. So we all have to kind of get on that boat and not like throw rocks and, and at places like Gallo and learn like how we can take advantage of that and learn that, you know, consumers may not want a big fat bottle of wine just to impress their friends. Um, they might they want to care what's inside the bottle of wine. And I would even say, I mean, you know, organics, not organics, fight for another day. But I, I would actually say like on balance, their, you know, their farming and their contracts are relatively 
progressive in the sense of, you know, yeah. there's, um, you know, they went through making Gallo Hardy Burgundy. So the notion that, that they can't go to different places, can't take advantage of the California Appalachian is, you know, they, 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 you know, they, they played in the world where they didn't have to have Napa Valley on the bottle. And I think that, um, you know, uh, they're honestly a, a solid example of being able to, to look forward um, before we all, you know, buy land in Oregon. And here, John, I want to, I want to, I want to, one of the closing things I'll state, I'll say is uh, I want to blow your mind with this one. Um, if I, if possible, if it's still around, because these, these, these things are trends and fads and bullshit, but um, if possible, I may, I, by 2025, I think I can have Larkmead in the raw fair. Um, we have, Seriously, we, um, I was looking at their rules, you know, like they wrote up, because everyone's talking about natural wines and shit, and like everyone's like writing rules, and they wrote up rules, and I'm like, I'm looking at them going, I can check off a lot of these rules. I'm like, we're gonna, by 2022, we'll be certified organic. We've been farming organically since 2015. Um, we are, um, you know, I, I use less sulfur than, than their, their, their peak level, yeah. subscribed level. Um, we created, in three years ago, I had UC Davis uh, uh, scrape the entire property of Larkmead and, and find a native yeast population that's unique to Larkmead. Um, so we have a pied de that we build every year now. Um, so we're kind of like naturally fermenting. We're moving away from um, uh, additions in the cellar. We're, we're focusing in on, we don't add water, we don't add acid, we don't do any of those things. I'm looking at this going, and then I want to do label ingredients. Like I want to, I want to actually, you know, go back to the days of Ridge and go back to the days of, you know, some of the older wines and like have things on a label to pr not to prove like that we can, I want to just, because I feel comfortable doing that stuff. Um, but it'd be really cool to have this great old estate, 125 year old estate to like be in this kind of new kids, you know, kind of, it's not a new movement as you know. And I want to ask you about your book before we, we sign off. Um, Cause you know, it's not like the raw festival and natural winemaking is not a new movement. It's, it's, uh, for, yeah. But you will have to grow white guy dreadlocks and smoke a lot of weed before you go to Raw Fair. Just saying. Um, so uh, going back to a question we had before. Um, all right. So Moscon has done remarkably well. Lark Mead is doing remarkably well. Um, if folks want to get these wines, uh, either, you know, through retail where it's complicated and through direct where it's also complicated, what's, what's your inside tip? Aside from just um, you know, pulling an alumni card. And, you know. No, you know, <laughs> the, I um, email me. I'm, if you, I'm the only person that works at Masakan, so if you email me, I'm going to email you back. I've been exchanging with one of uh, one of the uh, folks on the call today, um, and but yeah, no, there all the wines are available on my website. Uh, during COVID, I you know I took that whole like Napa Valley allocated idea away. I'm like, what the fuck? We don't need that. Um, people just need their wine. So you can go on, on the website and buy a couple bottles uh, straight on masacon.com. Lark Mead is um, selling a lot of wine direct. Uh, you can go on the website, just just sign in and or sign up and put your name in the system and then I'll allow you an opportunity to purchase stuff. We don't just put anything out there in like a, in a shopping cart kind of world. So we can have a whole other conversation about how backwards the wine industry is on e-commerce and um, and you know, it's like, everyone thinks like, oh my God, since COVID started, there's, a, there's this whole brave new world of e-commerce. I'm like, yeah, it existed for a lot of time, <laughs> for a long time. But, um, yeah, you can just go, go to the websites, larkme.com, moscon.com. Dan, thank you so, so much. Um, it's as always a pleasure. Wish we could be out there. Um, you may wish you were here. It's raining. So <laughs> soon, soon enough. And um, hey, you, one, one plug, John, for you. When's, uh, when's the new book coming out? Uh, next fall, hopefully. This is the new French wine. So for awesome. nothing to do with anything we talked about tonight. <laughs> well, when, maybe we can come back and do this and I can interview you about that book. Perfect. I love it. Awesome. Great to see you, John. Great to see you, Val. Thank you, Columbia community. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, um, uh, John. Uh, so we, we will uh, post the recording of this session in within 24 hours and uh, then um, uh, with your permission I can share your email with, uh, with the list of I think this is. That, would that be okay? Sure. Um, go for it. And, and uh, please check our website. There is a link to uh, John's book, uh, The New Wine Rules. 
um, and also the uh, the link for uh, to Masik and uh, if you'd like to know more about the wine. And thank you for uh, uh, both of you for being so generous with your time and appreciate for a great evening. Thank you guys. Cheers. Have a great night everyone on the East Coast. Bye.